something like 85% of singers will experience severe vocal problems in their career. Singing is an unnatural act. It's not the primary function of the laryngeal mechanism. Singers are terrified that something will go wrong with their voices. It's a very nerve-wracking and very difficult, very demanding profession. I remember someone saying to me, singers lose their voices like strippers get spots and rashes. The human voice, for most of us, when speaking, our passport to society. At the same time, it separates us from each other. We take it for granted. The singing voice, on the other hand, particularly that of a professional singer, is never taken for granted. But that is part of who they are, precious, personal, a kind of second face, their very identity. To lose it is nothing short of a catastrophe. They become a non-person. So why do singers, and for the purposes of this program, we're concentrating on international opera singers, lose their voices? We're not, of course, here talking about a temporary loss of voice through everyday ailments, but rather a seemingly devastating and unexpected watershed of the kind that terminates careers. Rosa Mannion is one of the most talented lyric coloratura sopranos of recent years. On the opera stages of Europe and the USA, she's received many accolades for her captivating singing. In 1997, she lost her voice. Basically, I became ill. I had a really nasty, vicious virus, which I suffered with for eight months. And the knock-on effect of that was that I suffered a paralyzed vocal cord and neuromuscular damage as well, although that wasn't actually diagnosed until two years after I stopped singing. So it was a huge shock. I mean, for literally one minute being able to sing anything to literally, practically overnight, losing a huge chunk of my voice. It was awful, nightmare. I was going through technical difficulties and felt that the only way to fix it was to really take a break, a good two-year, three-year break, and try and sort it out. Isabel Buchanan, another lyric soprano whose meteoric rise to stardom at a very young age under the patronage of Australian conductor Richard Bonning, left her ill-equipped for some of the roles that came her way. At that stage in my life, nothing was daunting. It was exciting and nerve-wracking, but I never for one moment thought, oh no, I don't think I can sing this. I could sing them, but I didn't really know how. And therefore, I didn't think ahead, would that role be really good for me or not? Is that the next logical step vocally, technically? I didn't think in that way. I thought, oh, I'd love to sing that. And because I sang naturally, I thought, yeah, of course I can sing it. <laughs> and enthusiasm <laughs> kind of won the day rather than any clear thinking. Very often singers are expected to be the finished product by the time they come out of college in their middle twenties. And there is no way vocally that they're ready for some of the things that they are expected to do. Paul Farrington is a much sought-after vocal consultant and teacher who's only too aware of the pitfalls. With young singers, if they're not well managed, they can do things too soon, they sing too often, they sing roles that are too big for them, in houses that are bigger than they should be singing in, with orchestras and conductors who aren't always as sympathetic to the singers as they should be. And I think that's where a lot of vocal problems arise. But sometimes, of course, the problems are not only physical or logistical. Christopher Hunt has been associated with the singing fraternity in several ways, including being an opera producer and as an artist's manager. It is truly absolutely baffling when a singer's voice disappears, as it sometimes does. There have been, in my experience, and everyone who works in this field must have come across many examples, a few singers of undoubted talent with a voice of real beauty who sing with real success for maybe 10 years, and then within two or three years, the sound simply disintegrates. 
Sometimes one feels that it really is a psychological question and it's a sort of psychosomatic illness that has really removed the ability to sing. Sometimes it seems more like a physical problem. Two examples that come to mind for me that were both very sad because they were extraordinarily gifted singers. One was a tenor, John Wakefield, charming on stage, musical, beloved by people, who really sang extraordinarily well for about 10 years. And the voice then developed first a sort of hoarseness and unevenness, and then really disappeared almost altogether. I live the wild and lonely life, guided by reckless passions. She brought me back to peace and calm, and made me understand how to love. My vocal condition is what they call spastic dysphonia, which means the muscles have lost their elasticity. Now, this can happen to anybody, and it's not necessarily overwork, it's the build-up of pressure. As a singer, you never stop working under pressure, because every time you open your mouth, whether it's performance or rehearsal, you're always being judged. Did she not promise I am yours? I love you and I am yours alone. And from that hope that blessed my life has been a vision, a dream of heaven above. The other was Norma Burroughs, a wonderful lyrics of Brett Sobrano, who I managed early in my and her career, and who, again, for about 10 years, sang all over the world, sang Blondchen at Salzburg and the Festival and New Production and so on, a top, top level stuff. <laughs> And then, and I felt in her case it was more psychological than physical. She was a very sensitive person. She had great self-doubts. And I felt that the pressures on her and from within her mind, on herself, were such that she, almost like a sort of death wish, eliminated her voice. It disappeared. It really did. She couldn't sing anymore. It's a very nerve-wracking and very difficult, very demanding profession. And if things are not going right, then it's very hard to make your voice be right. And also when you think all the emotions, you know, when you're unhappy, you cry, and that's your voice. And when you're happy, you laugh, and that's your voice. That's how you express everything. And if you're emotionally upset or if you're physically down, it's very hard to sing. Even little changes in emotional feelings or thoughts actually make a cell change in your body and affect very minutely everything to do with your body, including your voice. <laughs> A couple of years ago, I discovered that I'd actually undergone a huge hormonal upset from the birth of my first daughter. There's actually a change in the muscle fiber, which means that you can't achieve a fineness of tone. The edges of the cords don't meet in the way that they should. They form a thicker fold rather than the very fine fold that you need. And if when you think of it, the minute you become emotional or frightened, you feel it in your throat. So it makes it very crucial for a singer to try and remain balanced in every way, to keep an equilibrium and to look after uh, the complete self.
crisis period in 1983-4, where I really got fatigued in performance, and I blamed it all the time on this dryness thing that had come out in a period where I'd overworked a bit. And, um, <clears throat> and the annoying thing was the voice always sounded normal. It's just what I felt. And there, the In fact, it was normal. Rylan Davis, internationally renowned tenor, never did actually lose his voice. He carried on taking romantic leads before extending his career to the 37 years he's now been singing with character roles. But at the time, his feelings of vocal unease were compounded by emotional traumas experienced over a long period in a marriage which eventually ended in divorce. Afterwards, he visited a counsellor to seek advice. Well, you're a bit of a miracle, she said. I'm amazed you got that far before this caught up with you. She said, you've been carrying this emotional feeling of being not good enough, you know, as a man, and not, you know, all the things that something like that can do. And I, and I, I swear to you, um, I never blamed what happened to me on my first wife because we're, to this day, very good friends. But, you know, David, looking back now, 20 years later, I God, it must have had some strain on me, I suppose, because I was singing in all the big theatres, San Francisco, Chicago, Covent Garden. Immediately after I'd found out something in my early marriage that wasn't very pleasant. Sometimes the problems are not so close to home. The psychological demands of an international career are immense. I'm sure that has a lot to do with why many of them do lose their voices, but it's also much to do with the way of life. Never at home. You travel all the time. You're always having to be at your best. You're always having to impress new people that you are as good as they want you to be or they'd heard that you were going to be. You're living out of a suitcase, often in strange countries with strange food, unpredictable schedules. And above all, the strain of living constantly on the road, constantly, all their lives is, I think, enormous and mostly underrated and has, of course, got much worse over the last 25 or 30 years as jet travel has immensely increased. So that many gifted singers, some extremely gifted singers, don't make it past the first five or ten years. Some don't make it up past the first two or three. But the real crux is when they start after they've begun their careers to be really international. That's when the strain really shows. Christopher Hunt. At the time Rosa Mannion was approaching the red light, she had already undertaken, many months before, a hugely exacting schedule. Constanza in Mozart's opera, Il Seraglio, Massenet's Manon, and three different parts in Offenbach's Tales of Hoffman. I had to abandon the Constanza in France. I couldn't sing at all. I was in such a, a state where I was walking from my hotel room to the rehearsal room, which was, I think, about a five-minute walk, and I would have to stop and lean against a wall <laughs> to get my energy up. How I ever thought I would ever get through the rehearsal, I don't know, but I, I do. You just keep going. So I had to come home. I had six weeks off felt rested and went then to rehearse Hoffman at the Collie. It started off well and we had a very intensive and very long rehearsal period and I got more and more exhausted through that. The symptoms came back again, sore throats again, constant tummy upsets again, fevers again and by the first night I was absolutely exhausted. <laughs> With Isabel Buchanan, the problems were somewhat different. My first problems came when I came back to Europe after my three and a half years with the Australian Opera. The thing was that with the Australian Opera, I went to a big family. I was 21 years old, I was their kind of mascot, and everybody said, oh, isn't she gorgeous, isn't her accent lovely, oh, she's a lovely singer, Let come to our house and have dinner, come and stay for the weekend, and I was just like a member of a family. But when I came to Europe, I was on my own. Nobody cared whether I stood or fell. It was a very lonely business all of a sudden. 
the going away to a country where you don't speak the language, not knowing a single soul, and I wasn't prepared. Did you do other jobs in the interim? Yeah, I drove a, a taxi when my money ran out. I can never forget going on a call to somewhere in Acton and rang the bell, and out came Anne Evans. She said, oh, John, she said, what are you doing here? I'm just about to get a taxi to go to the Coliseum. I said, I'm your taxi driver. She said, oh, God, you're not. I said, yeah. Anyway, we had a chat. Because about a year before that, we'd done a gala together at the Old Wells. And uh, lovely, lovely lady, she really was. And, uh, you know, she didn't say anything at all. But, of course, a lot of people said, have you heard about Wakefield is driving a taxi? Well, you know... Better doing that than sitting on your backside. They thought it was catching. They didn't want to be associated with somebody who had these difficulties. Very odd, very odd indeed. When I stopped singing, very quickly I realised, to my sadness to this day, that all those people who hailed me and loved me and wanted me in the opera world always said, will you please come and sing this? Oh, you're so great. I love you when you do this. Da 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 da. Vanished without trace. I didn't receive a single phone call from anybody. Opera takes no prisoners. <laughs> True enough, particularly for John and Isabel. But it's not like that for everybody. As soon as it happened and it got out that I was in trouble, I had phone calls from goodness knows how many colleagues, all saying to me, it's happened to me. Stick in, you'll be fine. Just get through it, you'll be fine. It will pass, which was tremendously helpful. Also, I have to say, the management at the Collie were superb. They were wonderful, and they gave me the courage to keep going through the Manon because they had tremendous faith in me, which helped. And they also said to me, have your rest, but when you want to come back, let us know, because we want you back. So having that sort of encouragement behind me was, was tremendous because it gave me the incentive to continue and to find out what went wrong and to do the research I needed to do. As for Norma Burroughs, what were her feelings about the end of her career? Well, frustration, I suppose, really. Frustration. Yeah. What a sort of lack of ultimate fulfilment. Well, I just don't feel that I, um, I went to the end. I feel that I stopped when I was in my prime, really, and, and I, I just wanted to keep going. Of course, I, I, I suppose when singers retire, they feel different things, but when you retire, when you are at the end of your career, I suppose it, it's a lot easier than when you stop midway. You feel that some awful mistake has been made. 
and there just isn't anything that you can do about it. And you just feel, well, just, well, crippled almost. It's a, a very sad feeling of not being able to do anything about it and not wanting to accept it. And um, you couldn't accept it? Yes. I felt my identity was as a singer. And when I stopped singing, I felt I didn't have any identity, really, because singing was my life. And uh, I don't feel I ever got it out of my system. And I missed it terribly. Um, I don't know what to say. I don't know what I can say. I don't know what to say about this. I don't know how to answer that. If any are still in doubt, Norma's response surely shows what the loss of their voice means to a singer. There is a profound sense of shame attached to it for a singer. It's, it's the most horrible thing that can possibly happen because your identity is so bound up with your voice, your status, personality, everything you possess. And when that leaves you, it's absolutely appalling. Dinah Harris has been a distinguished singer herself. When she too lost her voice, or crashed as she calls it, she developed a particular interest in vocal conservation and repair. She now teaches and works in a voice clinic. Her brother, Tom, Tom Harris, is an ear, nose and throat surgeon with a subspecialty in voice. With state-of-the-art equipment to hand, he's helped resurrect the career of many a singer in trouble. To look at somebody's voice, first you need a telescope that will look round the corner with the bright light, and then we have a video to record the things that we can see. But the vibrating vocal folds are working too fast to be followed by the human eye. So what we do is we slow down the beating of the vocal folds with a flashing light called a stroboscope. And you can isolate a problem in the working rather than the appearance. I think for every voice problem there's a psychological component and whether the voice problem produces the psychological component or, or vice versa is questionable. People can lose their nerves or it can be something absolutely nothing to do with singing whatsoever and, and it becomes a sort of psychosomatic condition almost. It doesn't change the fact that the singer is unable to sing or is having great difficulty in doing that. From the singer's point of view there is a tendency to blame themselves first and foremost possibly employers, I don't know, agents, but, I mean, the bottom line is it happens. With the best will in the world, there are certain pressures and responsibilities. My feeling is the words, the show must go on, were not actually coined by an actor, they were coined by management, and for solid financial reasons. And so you have to tread as the laryngologist through this particular minefield fairly sensitively. I remember a famous singer who once said the most important word in the singer's vocabulary was no. And I think perhaps one needs to learn to be able to say no at quite an early age. It's very hard because it's terribly seductive. You get offered a role that you've always wanted to do and you're just not ready for it or it's just too heavy for you. The fear, of course, is that if a singer has a vocal problem of whatever sort, that suddenly they're going to be dropped like a hot potato by their management, by their opera company if they're a principal with a company or whatever so long as singers know and you know it only needs a number of high profile singers to speak out and say you know i have had a problem and it's been sorted so hope and help are to hand for those intimately concerned with the singers welfare and even with those who've lost their voices there's a pervading optimism and a desire to pass on the benefits of their experience to the next generation for this is above all a story of triumph over disaster. It's a psychological thing. It comes back to my thing with the young students I help now. They've got to quickly learn who they are vocally, what their voice will do and not do, so that they can become the teacher as soon as possible. Because when you're out on that stage, 
with all the teachers and coaches in the world, you are alone. I would love to pass on the experience that I've had to young people. I do a bit of teaching now and I love to see the young enthusiastic people who come along with their fresh young voices and um, I want to tell them of my experience and above all to show them the beauty and just what a wonderful career it is. I never thought of teaching a career. It was something you did when you stopped singing. Well, as it happened, I stopped singing earlier than I anticipated. And I've been in now 27 years working with some really good singers. I wouldn't say that my singing was, that I was ever blasé about it, because I loved it too much, but I think it's precious to me now. I think it has a totally different meaning for me now. And when I sing now, it's the best experience ever. It is time to go back to work now. Lots of the problems, the physical problems that I'd encountered as a result of the illness, like the paralysis of the vocal cord, the neuromuscular damage, have now receded. So I don't have an excuse anymore. Singers need to know as well that there is a support network out there, that there are actually people who understand the mechanism, who understand the way it works, have been singers who can actually sort the problem out. If you crash, don't give up. For quite a few people, it is possible to sort it out. I, I believe that absolutely fundamentally. It's important to realize if anybody who is listening to this program uh, and they're suffering at the moment, you're not alone. There's a lot of people going through this or have been through this and have come out the other end. So, you know, courage.